Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, it is uh, a pleasure to welcome you virtually to this event, uh, Rules of Origin, the Practicalities, which is very much a partnership between BCC and the UK Trade Policy Observatory, um, a sea of objective, sensible, calm advice in what is, as I'm sure so many of you are finding out, incredibly choppy and difficult waters. Um, and it is a really uh, useful time to have this issue. When I talk to businesses, I would say rules of origin is the number one uh, question that crops up across so many sectors. So that's why we've decided to put this on. And I think that is evidenced by the fact that we have significantly more than 1500 people signed up. Um, so it should be very, very interesting. We have um, an excellent panel with us today. Um, I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves shortly, but we have Anna, we have Paul and we have Michael, um, each of whom has a really deep and helpful expertise in this. And most importantly for people like me who are very firmly in the non-expert category is really, really good at simplifying what can be incredibly complicated stuff and very fact, um, fact specific. Which kind of leads me to my first point, my first caveat, which is um, this is um, really quite difficult area and it depends very much on the facts as your business faces them. So nothing we're going to say today should take the place for you very carefully examining the documents and taking proper qualified advice um, which um, can lead you how to act. We will do our best to um, give sensible helpful steers and I'm sure they'll be more than helpful and more than sensible but you know nothing in here can take the place for that kind of proper um, bespoke advice. Um, in terms of housekeeping, we will be recording this um, so that um, it can be of use to others. Um, and I certainly am going to rewatch it and steal all the pertinent points and apply them to my policy, um, which is pretty much how I do policy making, I'm afraid. And I'm sure that significant chunks of the civil service likewise. Um, we're going to do a couple of polls in a minute, which should be very, um, very helpful. Um, we want to get a sense of who you are. Um, what kind of businesses you're representing or what kind of areas. Um, and of course, to understand exactly how many of you are integrated in the BCC network as it stands. Just want to say a quick word about the BCC. Um, we are the British Chambers of Commerce. We are the longest standing business network in the UK. We've been around for more than 150 years. Um, within the UK, we have a network of 53 accredited chambers. We cover each and every part of the UK and in that we're unique. We are uniquely linked to each place. And I think the UK employers in our membership are around, uh, currently employ around 5 million people of all shapes and sizes and all sectors. The one thing they have in common is they're slightly more likely to be internationally active, which is why trade is such an important thing to us. Equally, um, we have an international network of around 70 representative bodies, a little bit newer, but as important. Um, and it gives us this truly global perspective uh, on which we draw daily. So it's an absolute pleasure to have, I'm sure, members from each of those places. Before we move on to the polls, I'm going to ask our august and expert panellists to introduce themselves. So uh, without further ado, uh, Anna, would you mind uh, just giving us a quick biography and, and how you came to be here? <laughs> uh, yes, sure. Thanks, James. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm the founder and director of the Trade and Borders Consultancy. I work uh, with a number of organizations in the public sector and the private sector. I have the pleasure of working with both UKTPO and British Chambers of Commerce. British Chambers of Commerce are one of my uh, oldest, I guess, clients, uh, I, I could say. Uh, I've been working on rules of origin for the last 15 years. I started uh, in academia, I did a PhD that, that was focusing on rules of origin in, in Asia and, and then continue to advise clients uh, on, on determining whether the projects originate or not and, and obtaining uh, all the relevant paperwork, certification, authorizations and so on uh, within uh, in three of the big four companies. So, so that was much more of a practical um, kind of side of, of, of rules of origin. I've also a couple of years back, I um, worked on a UN project on, on rules of origin tool. We created a global repository for, for rules of origin. 
uh, if anyone's interested, I think it's actually quite a good resource for a number of companies that might not know much about Rules of Origin. It's a good place to start. It's called Find Rules of Origin. If you just type that into Google, you'll find the tool. Uh, it's got quite a lot of information on Rules of Origin in, in general. So uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, one of my uh, areas of interest, I would say, of great interest, Rules of Origin. It's, it's a fascinating topic, although uh, that's true, it's not an easy one. Fabulous. No, thank you very much, Anna. And as you say, um, you are one of our key, probably our absolutely key go to expert in this field, and so many others and a real friend of the network. Um, and it's great to have you with us today. Uh, equally superb, I'm going to ask Michael to introduce himself, another brilliant friend of the network, uh, and also a person with a long and very storied uh, history in trade policy, um, both kind of in UK EU terms and, and a little bit broader. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and very much welcome to this event. My name is Michael Gasturek, um, and I am Professor of Economics at the University of Sussex, and I'm also the Director of the UK Trade Policy Observatory. Uh, so the UK TPO is an interdisciplinary, independent group of experts based at the University of Sussex, and we cover all aspects of trade. The UK TPO is a partnership between Sussex University and the Royal Institute for International Affairs, also known as Chatham House, and we established the UK TPO immediately after the referendum in 2016, and we bring together academics from a range of disciplines, economics, law, business studies, and practitioners with a deep knowledge and interest of all matters relating to international trade. So our focus is trade and certainly not just Brexit. And our aim is to undertake research, analyze, inform, and we try and engage as widely as we can with stakeholders, policymakers, media, and other researchers. So I'm a specialist in international trade. I've been working in trade for the donkey's years. Um, I started working on rules of origin in the early noughties, evaluating EU changes in their rules of origin and how this might impact on trade. So I have a long-standing interest in rules of origin, but I should probably stop there for now. Fabulous. Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, equally brilliant to have you along. And our, our third panelist, Paul, I'm just being told he's having some technical issues, which is... Uh, I guess part of the way uh, the world is going. Paul is um, one of our BCC experts. Um, he works in our trade facilitation team. So many of you would have uh, engaged with Paul um, and is a fantastic source of advice and expertise in this space and a key mover and shaker behind uh, Chamber Customs and all sorts of other incredibly exciting um, uh, initiatives that we are bringing to help what I still call because I'm old and a bit um, dog-eared UK PLC. Um, so um, I'm hoping that Michael will log back in. Um, final keep of piece of housekeeping from me is uh, in terms of questions. We're we're you know absolutely willing to take questions. We I think won't be able to answer them all. We've had a few pre-submitted. I think we'd probably be here for about twelve or thirteen hours, but we'll try and cover the major points. Um, do keep um, putting them into the Q&A box. If we can't get to them in the session, we'll do our best to answer them if they raise a significant new point. Um, I'm just going to ask Julia to um, put the polls up now. We're going to make you sing for your supper a wee bit. Um, we've called them delegate questions because that's a much gentler way of putting it. Um, clearly PR is very important. So the first one is just to get a sense of size and scale. Um, as ever with these things, there's no right or wrong answer. Um, in terms of cross-border employability um, within the EU and beyond. And then um, we're looking at exporting and importing practices. And that, that just helps us to focus in a little bit on, on the exact nature of where everything's going. And just while people are filling that in, Anna, I'm going to take the chair's prerogative and ask a question which hasn't been put in, I'm afraid, but um, it's one of the wonderful joys of being sat in my seat. Rules of origin, why do they matter? <laughs> why, why do they matter? Why are they important? Uh, if I'm running a business, why should that matter to me? Because uh, rules of origin matter, because if you have a trade agreement, which we now do have, uh, well, a fair amount of them, uh, not only with the EU, but with a number of other countries, rules of origin determine whether you can or cannot profit or, or use the tariff-free option. So uh, a trade agreement basically uh, allows you to trade with either lower or, or zero tariffs with, with your trading partner. 
But in order to do that, you have to meet rules of origin. They're basically a condition for the tariff-free or reduced tariff treatment. So now with this uh, new agreement with, that we have with the EU, we've heard a lot about it being tariff-free and quota-free, but what we didn't hear enough of is that it's tariff-free provided that your products meet rules of origin. By the way, I hope you can hear me better. I, I saw there were a couple of comments that uh, I'm very quiet, so hopefully it's better now. I know we've, we've known each other for six months and I would never have described you as quite, quite the opposite, in fact, which is one of the many reasons why we're, we're so happy to have you. So rules of origin, really important because without it, we can't bring companies or their products within preferential trade regimes. So, Michael, would you say this is a classic example of a non-tariff trade barrier if it's not done properly or sensibly? Is that how we fit it into the kind of policy of the Brexit landscape? That's a tricky question. The extent to which it's a barrier or not is sometimes sort of debated a little bit in the literature. I mean, essentially, as Anna has rightly just said, you know, the UK EU free trade agreement allows the UK to export to the EU duty free. But actually, that's not quite correct, that statement. It allows UK goods to be exported to the EU duty free, but that raises the question of what is a UK good? You have to prove that the good genuinely originates in the UK, and that's what Anna was explaining. To the extent to which that's a barrier is that if you make those rules, there are two ways in which you can think of this as a barrier. One way is it requires bureaucratic and administrative procedures in order to satisfy that rule of origin that you genuinely the good your good genuinely originates in the uk so the more difficult it is to provide the paperwork in a sense the greater the barrier because that just raises costs for firms the second way in which you might think of it as a barrier is if you make that rule of origin very very difficult in other words the conditions and i'll say a little bit more about this when i speak um if you make the conditions that are required that you are required to fulfill to prove that your good is a UK good. If you make that really, really tight and constraining, then you can think of that as a barrier. And certainly historically, other countries have at times used rules of origin precisely to try and prevent, um, to make it more difficult for countries to trade with each other. Hey, fantastic, that, that's, that's incredibly helpful and clear. Thank you both um, very much. So it's absolutely, critical, I suppose. Um, and I think that positions it really nicely for me. And, and I think that gives us a basis for looking into some of the, the, the more uh, focused questions which the audience have. But I, I believe we have the, the poll answers ready now. Um, I'm not sure if you can see them all, but uh, we have around a quarter of you are in the 50 to 249 employee business range. So this is the upper end of the SME. Um, but also nearly one in five, more than 250, and 14% of you not applicable, uh, which is always an interesting answer. Uh, I don't know whether that's um, sole trader or non-business, but everybody is of course welcome. Um, we have um, quite a lot of people, most people don't have a specific export staff, which um, I think bears out uh, our understanding to date and is, is one of the shifts I think we're probably gonna see in employment patterns over time. Um, equally, um, we've got a really nice balance um, in terms of who is employed um, outside the UK and um, we've got 40% are um, in the business of exporting products to the EU, um, only 30% to the rest of the world um, and I, I suppose it's the billion dollar question how much that will shift over time and whether both grow or neither grow. Um, and actually, um, it's a little bit closer to the balance between EU and rest of the world. In fact, it's exactly equal in terms of importing goods and, and services. Um, so that just gives us a sense of where we're coming from uh, in terms of the audience. So without further ado, we are gonna plunge into the questions, I think, if, if that's okay. And um, the first question, um, uh, I think flows very nicely, Michael, because so I'm going to come to you from, from what you've just said. So how, um, how weighty do you think that the paperwork uh, businesses have to face generally is? Do you think that the government has done a, a sensible job of minimising that? Do you think we're looking at a barrier or actually is this something where 
it's pretty much as good as it's going to get and we just have to learn to live with the, the current model. Um, I suspect that Anna's probably going to exactly. have more detailed knowledge of this than me, but let me say a little bit first. Um, so firms do need to be able to prove that their good genuinely originates in the UK. That doesn't mean you can't use inputs from elsewhere, but the extent to which you can do so will vary across different, uh, different products and, and across different sectors. The paperwork that's required under the TCA with the um, uh, EU is that and what the government has agreed is slightly unusual, in other words, it's not always the case in these agreements, is that it's either the exporter that can make the declaration or the importer that can make the declaration. And certainly on the UK side at the moment, the level of paperwork, the sort of easement procedure for the first few months, um, and for the first, I think possibly even up to first year, that doesn't require all of that documentation, documentation initially, although you might need to subsequently show it. So at the moment, you can have either the export or the importer self-certify, which is certainly should make it easier to meet those rules of origin. But I suspect that Anna might want to add to that. Fabulous, Anna. Um, over to you. Um, yeah, I think it might be useful to just take a one step back and, and kind of um, uh, talk about how you uh, meet rules of origin and kind of distinguish. I always talk about the three, three different levels here. So one thing is that you have to meet the actual rule of origin. Uh, so make sure that your products are, uh, that your products comply and you have to have, as Michael said, you have to have proof for that. Um, whatever that, that proof um, uh, is depending on, on the rule of origin and that's exactly Michael mentioned the simplification for so long-term and uh, supplier declarations and long-term suppliers declarations uh, which is a simplification although I still think that if uh, as a client you go back to uh, your supplier in the EU six months later six months down the line and say hey could you provide a long-term supply declaration now retrospectively they might uh, might or might not be willing to do that so we'll see how that works in practice so that's one part is meeting the rules of origin and having paperwork to demonstrate and prove that then you have the second level which is certification and again Michael uh, mentioned that you have self-certification under this particular agreement it's not equally it's not the same on both sides so um in the uk we don't as companies don't have to be authorized to do that we used to have something called approved exporter whereby in order to self-certify origin companies needed to get a special authorization from hmrc we no longer have that for that particular fta and we might no longer have that for other FTAs uh, uh, as well so in the uk you just provide the certification uh, as Michael said, either as an exporter or importer. In the EU, you still have the REX number, you still have the authorization, so it's not necessarily as easy uh, on, the, uh, on the EU side. Uh, so, so that's certification. And then the final layer of rules of origin, the final layer of potential paperwork is around meeting all the other origin requirements. Rules of origin are often referred to as, as just rules of origin, but it's rules of origin for products, product-specific rules of origin, plus much wider origin requirements, such as requirements around how goods are transported, uh, requires, uh, requirements around accumulation. This is where uh, the Percy Peak issue uh, comes in. Uh, so, so there are potential uh, requirements for paperwork here as well uh, that, that might uh, come into uh, to play depending on how you ship your goods and how you move your goods. So you need to be able to do all, or maybe I'll put it differently. You need to be able to address all these three levels and layers in order to move your goods under preference. If your product meets rules of origin, but you're unable to certify, or you're able to certify your product meets rules of origin, but it's not shipped in the right way, or it's transshipped somewhere else or, or something else uh, um, occurs, you don't satisfy, you, you don't satisfy the, the, the wider rules of origin, your claim is still rejected. So it's not just the product specific rules of origin, it's all three of these layers have to be addressed and you need to be comfortable that you know what you're doing in, in all three areas. Fabulous, thank you. And, and I think that's the key point, isn't it? It's cumulative, each of those three layers. Michael, I, I saw you raising your hand. I wasn't sure if that was Percy Pig specific, which is where my eye is pricked up. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I did want to add something to this. I think it's, it's even worth stepping back on another layer um, in terms of this discussion. Now, many of the people on this webinar may well be aware of this, but I suspect that many people also probably won't be 
of what are the types of rules that need to be satisfied in order to get originating of purposes. Now, what does it mean? How do I, not just what paperwork is required, but what is the underlying rule that I might need to meet, need, might need, need to meet? So basically, typically, there are three or four broad categories of rules that are used. And I'll just quickly go through those, but that will give those on the webinar a sense of if you're to provide proof, depending on the product that's being exported, this is what you will need proof with respect to. So one of the common rules is that the intermediates that you're using have to be from a different tariff classification category to the good that you're exporting. So for example, you might import some cloth as an intermediate good from elsewhere, but if you turn it into a shirt, so you've changed the tariff line, you can then export it to the EU duty free. And that's called the change in tariff classification rule. But in order to prove that your good is genuinely a UK good, you'd have to prove precisely that you imported some cloth and turned it into a shirt, that you changed the tariff classification. The other common rule that's used is as an alternative is a minimum level of domestic value added. So for example, there has to be at least 40% or 50% UK input in the good before it can be exported to the EU and vice versa, obviously EU exporting to the UK. And the third most common rule that's used is where you specify a, predict, a, a very specific production process. So for example, in the UK EU agreement with regard to electronic integrated circuits, if you are using inputs from elsewhere, let's say from China, they must undergo a diffusion, is what the rule says. I've got no idea what undergoing a diffusion means, but they have to undergo a particular production process. Now, what people often don't realise also is that these rules are used in combination frequently. It's not as if it's either this or that. Sometimes it is, but sometimes they're used in combination that you have to have a change in tariff classification and a specific production process or and a minimum domestic value added. So these rules apply to every single product and in different combinations and they are quite complicated. So in terms of meeting the rule, that first layer that Anna talked about, well, that, those are the rules that you would have to meet. Then you have to get certification and the paperwork to prove that you do so. Fantastic. Thank you, Michael. I think that's right. It's it's a degree of change which they're looking at in each step. And and, and Paul, welcome back uh, after your your IT difficulties. I, I hope I think I did a pretty decent job of introducing you, but um, hopefully you won't sue me for libel or slander or anything further down the line. One of the questions that comes in, Paul, um, around that is this slightly odd position of taking things that are from the EU doing something with them in the UK and then taking them back to the EU and that how that works in terms of rules of origin and tariff. Is that something you've come across and, and where those thresholds are? Um, I, I think there's a lot of people who would find that really interesting to hear about. Yeah, I mean, a lot of the questions we're being asked as a network um, is around goods coming into the UK um, and then being re-exported. So obviously the UK was a major distribution centre both to the EU and other countries. Um, that model may have to be looked at now because goods that come in and then are not manufactured in any way, processed in any way, do not get UK origins, so they don't qualify for the... This is the Percy Pig uh, issue again. Um, and that, ha that is causing a lot of confusion, um, especially in respect to Ireland and the Northern Ireland goods going over the border there. So that's a real issue because a lot of companies bring stuff in from the EU, they split up the the shipment and then send it on some of it on to Southern Ireland. And um, you can't really do that anymore. Um, the goods can cross UK using transit, which is a uh, one solution, but it doesn't really help help the distribution center part. Um, there is something called minimal processing. And if you go onto the HMRC website, you can get the list of um, things that they consider don't try to change the origin, which is a uh, quite an interesting list. The other thing to note is, and I think this is coming up from the little bit I've listened to so far is, but those list of minimal processes actually change for each agreement. I mean, they are broadly the same, but they do change for each agreement. So we can no longer say, okay, these are the rules. You have to say, this is the rule for exporting from the UK to Mexico and look at the rules that apply to there. If you then want to export um, to Vietnam, they're gonna be different rules. 
Uh, and by the way, um, approved export is still is used in for some trade agreements. So we have a real combination of ways of uh, declaring origin in the UK now, which could get uh, very confusing, um, including importer knowledge, um, which is something that is um, very new to trade agreements. No, yes, that, that's absolutely true. It's it's a much less unified world. I think we a lot of our members are seeing, which is difficult. That that's that's really handy. Thank you. And I think really does emphasise the point you made earlier about there's no one size fits all answer to any of this. It, it needs to be very focused advice. And one of the, the the phrases you said has come up a few times in the question, um, and that's long term supplier status, which isn't a, a way around this, but seems to be a useful status to have in a lot of context. Can you just un unpack that a little bit more for the audience, please, and just and, and a sense of how that's useful and in what context? Oh, this yeah, is where my, my, oh, I was going to say, I'll let Anna answer this one. Oh, sorry, I thought it was for me, James. I don't know, was that? Yes, yes. Uh, well, Anna, let's, yes, if you wouldn't mind, that would be great. Um, uh, okay, so uh, long-term uh, supplier declarations and long-term supplier decl declarations. That's something that we uh, had. We, we've uh, this is a part of the of the uh, European, I, I guess, customs uh, legislation. It's basically to do with situations whereby you are exporting something, but you're not the manufacturer of the product. So as a result, you don't know whether the product is originating because you don't have enough details. As Michael explained. Determining whether the project product is originating requires you to know how it's been manufactured, what went into it, what's the percentage, has it changed tire classification. You need to know these uh, uh, these details about the product. And if you're not the manufacturer, if you're not the producer, you might not be aware of that. The other uh, element or the other uh, time where such declarations are required is when you are, for example, manufacturing a product, you're producing something but you're using a substantial amount of inputs and you want to know whether the inputs that you're using into in your product are originating because you need to calculate the percentage so for that you need to know whether the the goods that you are using are, are originating and you do that through these declarations so uh, a supplier would basically provide it's a one-page document there's a, a template for it but it's quite flexible and and it basically says i the manufacturer the producer of these products certify that these products are originating based on rules of origin in the agreement with that or for the, for that country or another country. So you have a, you have it as a one off a supplier declaration or you have it as a long term supplier declaration, meaning that it covers uh, a, an entire period of time, such as a year. And you basically state that all the products you as a, as a client purchase from me are originating throughout this year. And if they're not, I will tell you. If something changes, I will basically let you know. And these documents are just supporting documents for, for uh, demonstrating uh, origin, preferential origin. It's just something you need to keep on, on, on record, um, which, which again, is, is now there's a bit of a simplification for the next 12 months, but uh, it's, it's usually, uh, it's, it's a pretty straightforward part of origin certification normally. And it also helps you to have this conversation with your supplier. Uh, you, know, you, do, do you do need to ask them whether the products are originating if you are thinking of selling them or exporting or importing anything under preference. Fabulous. No, thank you. Anna. That, that feels like a very useful thing to have and uh, and to have ready to, to deploy. Um, Michael, just coming to you next on, a, on an, I'm going to ask you about something we don't have in terms of the, the TCA, which we as an organization asked for in quite a few places, which is diagonal accumulation. Now I've written it in many documents and I've never been in time. I may even have mentioned it in my interview for this job, but as <laughs> recently, I'm, I'm not absolutely sure what it is, but I, I do know we don't have it. Can you just unpack that a little bit, please? And, and, and um, do that because we, we, one of the other questions we often get is, is this diagonal accumulation? We have to say that's the wrong question, but it'd be useful to know a little bit more. Yes, sure. Um, in fact, it's also partly raised by part of Anna's response to the last question about thinking about the goods that you're buying, whether they originate or not. So what has been agreed in the TCA, in the agreement between the UK and the EU, is imagine that, let's take perhaps the simplest example, which is the value added rule. Imagine that the rule is that there has to be at least 50% UK value added in that product, such that when you export it to the EU, 
you can get the preferential access, i.e. no tariff being levied on the export to the EU. In working out how much of your value added is domestic, is UK value added, you're allowed to use any inputs that are EU inputs, that are originating in the EU. In other words, you can accumulate, you can add the EU bits with the UK bits. Suppose you've got 20% of inputs that you bought from the uh, EU that are considered to be EU goods, and you've got um, 25% UK value added, add the two together, that's 45%. And if the value added rule is the 40% rule, you've crossed that threshold. The good is deemed as originating in the UK. So when you export it back to the EU, it's going to be duty free. So that form of accumulation of origin, of adding up that value added, where you can use both EU bits and UK bits, is bilateral accumulation because it's with the partner country. It's with the country that you have signed the agreement. Diagonal accumulation, and there are other variants of this, if I can call it that, sometimes called extended or cross accumulation, is what happens if the UK buys an intermediate input from Japan, for example, and then uses that intermediate input to produce a final good and exports that final good to the EU. Are there any circumstances under which the UK could count the Japanese input also as originating in order to get that preferential access to the EU? If it were allowed to do that, then that is an example of what's usually referred to as diagonal accumulation. As I said, there are other variants of this, and let me call that extended accumulation. So diagonal accumulation gives you the possibility of bringing in and using inputs from third countries, countries which are not part of your bilateral agreement between the UK and the EU, and also to count those as originating. So clearly the more you can diagonally, if I can put it that way, originate to use inputs from third countries, the easier it is to access the EU market duty free. Obviously, that will depend a lot from industry to industry. There are industries, sectors, firms that buy inputs from third countries, i.e. not from the EU, um, widely. There are others that do so much less. So it will vary tremendously according to the sector. But in principle, the, e the more diagonal accumulation is allowed, the easier it should be. Now, that form of diagonal accumulation or any form of diagonal or extended accumulation is not in the agreement with the EU. It's one of the uh, things that the UK did not manage to achieve. It wanted to have that form of third party or third country accumulation. It was in one of its requests in, um, in the draft FTA that the UK drew up, but it wasn't something the UK agreed to. Um, and that's, I think, a big loss for the UK. There are other areas in the rules of origin that were agreed that I think the UK did um, relatively well. In some senses, um, there are some things that the UK did gain in terms of those rules of origin, but not having any form of diagonal accumulation in, and, and, no, and no discussion of it even. There's not even a clause that says this is something that we might consider in the future or we're open to discussion or thinking about this. There's just no mention of diagonal or extended accumulation. And that means that the only form of uh, accumulation that we've got is this bilateral between the UK and the EU itself. And that's going to impact on trade flows, I think, in the future and on the way supply chains are organised. Uh, absolutely. Not to, not to coin a phrase, diagonal accumulation isn't that far from having one's cake and eating it, I suppose. Um, which is the absolute last time I'm going to use that phrase in one of these, I promise. So um, if we could just, that, that's really helpful. So I think um, we should probably come back to what's in the agreement. I'm sorry for asking you a, a question about what's not in the agreement, but who knows where this will go, Michael, as I've never seen any kind of treaty with quite so many provisions for uh, rebuilding it, adding to the foundations, et cetera, et cetera. But Paul, just coming back to this, this value add question, which I think is absolutely the core of a lot of this within Anna's kind of three layer model. But one of the things that comes up is, does that value add or does that change of use have to be around the thing that's imported or can it be different? So if I, 
change the box, if I add some marketing value, if I repurpose it slightly. You know, how, how is that to be judged? Is it a question of art or science, I suppose? And, and how does one go about working it up in a way that is adequately permissive, but equally adequately defensible at law? Uh, well, that's a good question. So it's the minimal processing. So generally repackaging in all the agreements is not considered to be a process that confers origin. Things like painting. Um, the, uh, the example I've come across recently was if we import fish from Norway, uh, slice it up and then sell it out in consumer sized bit back to Europe, that would not, the actual preparation of the salmon wouldn't change the origin of it. However, if that salmon comes in from Norway, it is smoked, so it obviously becomes smoked salmon and is then sliced up and sent out, that would change this, the origin of the goods. So, that, so you have to look at your commodity code for your goods, go back to the rules of origin, look at the minimum processing and see if that confers origin. Simple, um, a simple construction, so if you just add a couple of components together, often doesn't count as, um, conferring origin or even simple disassembly will not count as conferring origin. So you do have to look at a product by product basis and see what you're doing to change the origin. Okay, fantastic, that, that's really helpful. And I, and I guess otherwise it would create all sorts of loopholes that sneaky yeah. types like you, me and others would, I have no doubt, um, try and find a way around. Um, and, and I think that moves us on to the movement of kind of physical goods a little bit as well. And I'm, I'm going to ask you this, if that's OK. And the direct transit rules seem to integrate with some of these things at a few points. Can you just run us through how those interfaces work and, and whether there are any specific things to really be aware of? Uh, yes, absolutely. So th this provision is, is uh, one of these, just like non-manipulation or um, um, minimal processing, it's one of those standard provisions that we see in every single FDA uh, it has very, many variations and, and different names. Uh, in in uh, in the old days, I would say in the in the older versions of agreement, it was simply called direct uh, shipment or direct transport or, or whatever you want to call it. It was basically a provision that said that you have to uh, ship goods from the country uh, where they originate to to the country that's uh, under the preferential agreement. There, there's no kind of stops, no transshipment and so on. This caused a lot of problems. If you think of, uh, for example, EU's agreement with South Korea, and you think of uh, goods going uh, by, by a container, uh, if, if you're talking about SMEs, companies that uh, export smaller volumes, they obviously cannot fill an entire container. So these goods have to stop somewhere, uh, often Singapore, uh, get repackaged, get, get, uh, get kind of, um, uh, the, the consignments are split. Some of the goods go to China, some of the goods go to South Korea. So if you're doing that, uh, then obviously you don't have direct shipment. The goods have stopped somewhere. They were unpacked. They were packed into a different container, a different boat or uh, ship and so on, and, and went on to South Korea. So that ca can cause a lot of problems. As a result of situations like this, we now have in modern agreements what's called non-alteration rule. It's basically a provision that says that the goods can stop somewhere and can be uh, uh, transshipped somewhere, uh, but they cannot be altered. And here is again, and, and this is what we have in, in the TCA as well. It's not a direct ship and it's a, a non-alteration provision. But here again, we have a lot of uh, problems in practice. I think with a lot of these issues around origin, you have what the trade agreement says, and then you have what happens in practice and what the um, uh, what the interpretation of local customs officers are is so with with the non alteration is uh, uh, non alteration provision. The question is how you then demonstrate to the customs officers in the country where you're claiming preferential origin and you're claiming these these reductions that the goods have be have remained under customs control. So if you're, if you're trying to demonstrate that the goods have stopped somewhere, but they haven't been altered, there's this, there's this condition that they have to be under constant customs control, meaning that someone's keeping an eye on them, that nothing's added, there's nothing changed, that nothing's subtracted. So um, in, in practice, it can be done in, in many ways. It's quite difficult because the country that you're transshipping through very often has no 
uh, obligation to provide anything. It's, it's not a member of that agreement. It's a third country. Uh, so you are in a way relying on, on uh, customs officers in, in that particular country. So there are a lot of, and we've seen over the years, a lot of issues with, with demonstrating that. And we've seen cases where you know, goods met rules of origin, they were, uh, they had the certificate, but because of issues of, with demonstrating they remained under customs control, uh, the preferential origin claim has been rejected. So it's it's a bit of a it's a bit of a difficult one. We are trying. I mean, I'll say differently. There are initiatives uh, at the moment to try to harmonize that and find a, a kind of globally recognized way of providing that evidence so that companies uh, know what to look for and 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 customs authorities know what to uh, what to issue. But uh, yeah, it's still definitely an ongoing issue. Fantastic, thank you, Anne. and I, it's only a matter of time before a very sharp IT supplier starts uh, doing all sorts of very fancy PowerPoints with the words blockchain in, uh, which is normally where these kind of conversations go. So that, that's very helpful. Michael, coming to you, I'm going to try and make this a wee bit more complicated now, just again, because it's Chair's prerogative. You know, a lot of our discussions have been not simple, but, you know, you something, and, and actually one of the comments did note a difference between smoking for longevity and smoking for flavour. Um, but you chop it up, it's a different thing. But if I'm manufacturing a car, you know, the gearbox may be shipped in from South Africa, the design may be German, the, the factory happens to be in the Midlands of the UK, et cetera, et cetera. That's the reality of a lot of the modern commercial world. And some of that I think can get lost in the political discourse. Are the rules fundamentally the same in that situation or is it, it, does that make it easier to hit the thresholds or, or more difficult? Or is it, um, is it basically just apply the same rules in the same kind of way? So I didn't catch the first part of the question. Did you say, is it disabling that situation? Not disabling, is it, is it fundamentally similar? So I, I suppose, is it, do you just think about it in more uh, complicated ways, but it's the same set of questions? or do slightly different regimes apply. And I apologize, my Wi-Fi is now going a bit uh, stop-starty, so if, if that, that may not be helping. Um, if I've understood the question correctly, I think basically it's, it's the same situation. So, you know, we know that modern supply chains are complex. We know, to get, take your car example, that firms, car producers, manufacturers, are buying parts from all sorts of countries around the world. And in order to claim that originating status on exporting to the EU, you've got to be able to provide the documentation to prove that you've met be it the value added rule, the change in tariff classification rule, whatever that rule is. Um, now that's gonna have an impact on firms, clearly. So in comparison to the situation sort of prior to uh, December the 31st, when none of this was required, because UK tariffs were the same as EU tariffs. Essentially, up until December the 31st, we were using the same tariff as the EU. There was no need for rules of origin. The reason we need these rules of origin is because now we have different tariffs to the EU. So take, for example, carpets. The EU tariff is 6.4%. The UK tariff is 0%. The reason we need these rules of origin is because the EU wants to ensure that a Chinese carpet exporter doesn't ship the good to the UK, pay zero tariff because the UK tariff is zero, and then ship the good on um, to the EU duty free. It can't do that because it has to prove it, it uh, a UK carpet and not a Chinese carpet. So the very reason why we need these rules of origin is because we've chosen to have different tariffs to the EU. That's going to have an impact on companies because it changes firms' costs. It changes firms' costs because either firms have to pay the cost of maintaining the paperwork, going through all those that bureaucratic procedures that they need to go through in order to prove they've got originating status, or they choose not to do this because it's too costly and pay the tariff, and if the tariff is low, if it's 2% or 3%, the EU tariff, some firms may say it's just not worth trying to prove originating status. We'll just accept that we have to pay a tariff. But that obviously means that the cost in the EU becomes higher because there's a tax that's paid as, as the good is imported by the EU. All firms, 
like car manufacturing firms, will shift their production processes, rearrange their supply chains in order to ensure they get originating status. And how can you rearrange your supply chains, reconfigure your supply chain, either by sourcing more domestically from within the UK or by sourcing more from the EU? And that way you might meet the rules of origin requirement. So either way, th there may be impacts and consequences on sectors and industries. The final point I will make is that won't be true for all sectors and industries. There's a whole range of sectors, whole range of products where the EU tariff is zero. The EU doesn't levy a tariff on all goods. On a very large number of products, the EU tariff anyway is zero. So even if you don't prove originating status, there is no tariff to pay because the EU tariff is zero. So whilst for some sectors and some products, the consequences on supply chains, the way you configure your supply chains, may be quite large. For others, there may be no impact at all. Yes, so it's very sector specific. There's, it's not the same across each one. No, that that's really interesting, and I guess that's as much a political decision and a product of negotiation as as anything else. I was going to say anything rational, but that would be to give a particular view of political decision making. Um, and, and and I think that that's starting to make a lot more sense to me. Paul, can I ask you a little bit about repair? So the moment we've been thinking about producing, manufacturing, you know, almost bolting things together. What about where there's a machine made in Germany, being used in Greece, let's say, um, it needs to be repaired, it's a big machine, let's send it to Wolverhampton and get it back up and running again. Do the rules of origins bite in that circumstance? Do they have an effect or, or is that kind of whistled away somehow? It depends on the basis of which they're imported, and I'm hoping Anna will correct me if I get this wrong. Um, but generally, if they were so, when you import goods into the UK or export them out of the UK, you can use different um, customs procedure codes, which tell HMRC whether you intend it as a permanent export or a permanent import. Um, so, for repair, there is something you can import them on a temporary basis and then re-export it and in that case you don't need to worry about rules of origin as long as you temporarily imported it back into the UK in the first place however there's a caveat to that in that you usually need HMRC authority to be able to import goods on that basis in the first place. Anna do you want to uh, quickly comment on that? Yes I think it it's a complicated one because there are various different types of reliefs, authorizations, and options. Um, it really, there's also the returned good relief, there's outward processing relief. Uh, it really depends on what happens to these goods, uh, how these goods were used, uh, are you planning on bringing them back, um, and what's going to happen with these goods when you when you return them or you send them to the other other customs territory? There are various options to avoid it. It's not to avoid paying tariffs. It's not necessarily uh, a one size fits all answer. Uh, I think my, my advice here would be to to, to look at the different uh, customs reliefs. There are there are a number of options uh, within. This, these are not options connected to rules of origin. These are basically options related to. Um, goods they either, as, as, as Paul said, come into a customs territory uh, on a temporary, uh, well, uh, on a temporary basis, or goods that are being repaired, or goods that are being returned, uh, or goods that are just being sent out for for processing specifically. So um, this is slightly different than the rules of origin, but there are various ways of avoiding tariffs if these movements occur. The um, and really to go back to Michael's point, a lot of the time you do need to look at the tariff that's actually involved. Because again, because a lot of stuff is very either zero or very low tariff, most of the time it's just easier to import it and pay the taxes than it is to actually go to all the trouble of avoiding the, the tariff. Um, Although import VAT sometimes can can be an issue, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you normally you can claim the import VAT back yeah. if you're a business, but uh, yeah, it's it's not straightforward, unfortunately. No, I I I think that that's going to be the key lesson that a lot of our our. our um, this will take is there's very little in this space that is straightforward uh, but that that's incredibly helpful and um, Anna I'm going to come to you I, I realize you, you half answered that last question I'm afraid but uh, all roads lead to Geneva um, 
Are there any ways in which a pure service provider would need to think about rules of origin and apply some of these things to the way they're operating? And, and is that a simpler process? Or actually, is it only where there's something tangible, something physical at hand that really they need to start doing these complicated things and, and reading through these difficult, difficult texts? Um, well, service providers have their own complications and they have their own, there, there are rules of origin for services, but they're completely different and they have nothing to do with these rules of origin. These rules of origin that we're uh, talking about today relate to goods. So you need to move something tangible for these rules of origin to apply. That is not to say that service providers don't need to think um, uh, about uh, other issues. And I think one interesting thing is when, when a company considers itself a pure service provider, but they are actually moving goods mm. across borders. And, and, and you know, that is very often leads to a situation where, where customs is not uh, considered because we are a service provider. So I think that, that that's, that's the solution. But for that, for the particular uh, question around these rules of origin, it, it's, it's good. You, you don't need goods for, for them to apply. Yeah. It does raise, sorry, I'm just coming in on this. It does raise, it does raise another interesting question, which is imagine again, the, previous examples that we've talked about that you've got to have a, a minimum amount of domestic value added um, and that your foreign value added share can't be too high it raises the question of whether that foreign value added share refers to just the goods that you buy or services that you buy because increasingly many goods um, in, you know there's lots of services embodied you know it might be design services accountancy service whatever so do you count for the services that you buy from abroad as well do they count part of that foreign value added now my understand and there's there's a sort of debate in the literature about whether rules of origin should be moving to including services now my understanding from the tca be interested in paul's and anna's views on this that services that you buy from abroad you, you don't use those in the calculations. It's just materials. It's just goods that you're buying from abroad that count for the foreign value added share. Well, I, I, in which case I'm going to open that to, uh, well, let's go to Paul first and then we'll come back to Anna for views. Sorry, Paul, you can go first on this one. Oh, thank you. I, this is getting slightly beyond what I can comment on comfortably, but uh, as far as I understand it, it is just a material. So often the question is asked, you know, we there's a PC board with a bit of software embedded in it. Does that software count towards the, uh, the origin of the goods? Um, I guess that would get caught up in the value because obviously you've increased the value and the profit um, you know, from the profit is, uh, is originating. So I guess it gets caught up that way, but I'd be, uh, I'm waiting on Anna to give me a, a better answer. Fantastic. Well, I, I thought that was beautifully sidestepped, Paul. You clearly played some rugby in your past. Um, Anna, I, I'm buying a big computer contract. I'm also paying them to keep those computers up and running. I, I think Paul's answer was absolutely spot on. So uh, just, just as, as background, you, when you talk about calculating value or percentage or so on, you do it based on the, let's say, X work price of the product. So you do it on the value of the product. So there's a, an element of uh, value that... that um, relates to processing, uh, um, relates to, to the way that the goods is manufactured, which which is not a tangible, not, it's not just tangible inputs, but uh, services and the, the thing that Michael, that the reason why I smiled, the thing that Michael is talking about is, is the current over the last couple of years is one of those um, debates in the in the origin uh, uh, or in the in the customs environment around mode five so how much of of services should be included and and if they should be excluded should it be done under trade agreements like the tca or under the valuation uh, agreement uh, under the world customs organization so this is very much still open uh, the the tca has uh, inputs and processing so that, that that kind of the value of processing is also Included all the processing. Processing itself can also help to achieve origin. However, services, uh, as in as in pure services, are, are still not are not included. As uh, Michael said, it's a very interesting debate, and um, perhaps that that is where where rules of origin should be going to or should be heading uh, towards. But uh, it's at the moment still a, a, a policy debate rather than than an actual uh, option. Fantastic. Well, I, I think that's a really good point to draw this this conversation, or at least the questions part of this conversation, to an end. Um, 
I feel that these are points which could go on for many, many hours with me hanging on for dear life, but fascinated throughout. I'm going to just um, turn to each panellist in a second just to, to sum up and give any concluding remarks they want to or not to if they, they don't want to. Um, but I just want to say thank you to Michael, to Anna and to Paul for that. It's been absolutely fabulous, fantastic. I feel like I've learned a huge amount. Um, even as I was trying to keep up with the 200 odd questions that we had in and the 10 or 12, which I think is still pretty good going that we managed to answer. So um, concluding remarks, Paul, I'm going to come to you first, if that's OK. We'll do it in reverse order from the way we started. And also as the um, the, the, the slight slap on the wrist for having poor IT. Oh, thank you. Um, Crikey. So really, it's going back to what we said at the beginning. You've got yeah. to look at each agreement in turn. You've got to know your commodity code, look at the rules for your code. You've got to do all that work. Your chamber, of course, I should plug the uh, British Chamber of Commerce. So your uh, staff at the Chambers of Commerce can offer some guidance. Obviously, they won't be able to give you detailed consultancy, but they can offer guidance on where to look and, and some general oversight to the rules. Obviously, they issue the EUR1s, which are still confusingly being issued, but it's now the UK version of the EUR1, which is issued for most trade agreements. So Chambers can still give you some advice and guidance there. Fabulous. No, I think that's absolutely right. And the Chamber Network is fundamentally a force for incredible good in terms of trade and all sorts of other areas. And I, I know you're a linchpin of that, Paul, so thank you very much. Um, Anna, I'm going to come to you next, I think, if that's OK. So almost reverse order, we're going anti-clockwise as you come on my screen. Any any concluding points or observations you wish to make or any uh, areas where you wish to point out that the questions I asked were wrong, which is always a bit of a concern? Uh, first of all, I would definitely echo what Paul said. Uh, Chambers of Commerce are a fantastic source of uh, help, information, and so on. Uh, um, I, I also uh, provide some some kind of uh, advisory services and uh, through through British Chambers, and it's, it's one of these places that definitely should be first stop in terms of uh, getting help. Concluding remarks. Other than that, I would say um, it's it's not easy, but like everything else, it comes with practice. It's um, you know, it's, it's something that it's better to try and get it wrong the first time that then continue trading under full tariffs. There's a number of uh, companies, uh, not only in, in EU but or in, in Europe, but in general, globally, we see that trade agreements are signed and the utilization rates of them are low, meaning that companies prefer very often to, especially if the tariff rate is about two, three, five percent, to pay the tariff rather than uh, attempt to understand rules of origin and trade under preference. That might be a short-term solution, but if there is a trade agreement, it's really worth trying to understand rules of origin, trying to use them in practice and see whether you can get that discount. It all, it all adds up. Customs duties are a cost to the bottom line. You can't recover them. So if you can save even the five, six, seven percent, that's uh, that's obviously a, a game changer to, to a certain extent. So I would definitely encourage people to try to understand rules of origin and see whether their goods can uh, meet them. If you can't, you can't, but if, if it's possible, it, it might be worth it. No, I, fantastic. I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things we'd, we would like to do is try and stop this becoming a competitive advantage for larger companies who have the wherewithal to understand it and then can apply that. Um, you know, if in any other field, we said with a bit of effort and time and thought, maybe a little bit of investment, you can take 7% off your costs. I think they'd be snapping up. Uh, and if we could do that, we'd be very rich people. Um, Michael, um, uh, from our uh, partners at UKTPO, um, uh, other than my minor summing up, final thoughts, observations from you, please. And Thank you. Yeah. So relative to what we had before, rules of origin in introduced additional complexity. Anna just said that firms, you know, when tariffs are, I don't know, between three and five percent may choose to pay the tariff. That gives you a ballpark figure, perhaps, of what the costs of meeting rules of origin requirements are. It's of the order, we think, of about between three and five percent. So leaving the EU, that's one of the consequences. The actual rules of origin that the UK agreed with the EU appear to be relatively liberal. In that sense, that's possibly a positive outcome. The negative outcome is that the UK did not achieve any diagonal extended accumulation, allowing third country inputs to be used. And all of this, as I said earlier, is going to reconfigure supply chains. 
um, and that will do so more in some sectors than in others. The final thing I want to say, sorry, it's going to be a shameless plug here. Rules of origin are but one part of the TCA with the EU. There are many, many other parts. And at the UK TPO, we have just produced three briefing papers which summarise the TCA and go through what has and hasn't been achieved and what the implications are. So if you're interested in the impact on trading goods, if you're interested in the impact on trade and services, if you're interested in the governance arrangements, the level playing field and use of subsidies and so on, then please go and look at our three briefing papers which are on our website. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you, Michael. I, I think that's brilliant. And, and um, I, I would wholeheartedly recommend that if you look, for example, at our um, more high level analysis of the deal, it, it lots you may think that we were inspired heavily by some of Michael's earlier articles about the framework for analysing any trade deal and, and I won't be drawn. Um, certainly not at this time of the afternoon. Maybe once I've had a beer, I'll tell you the truth. But look, that was absolutely fabulous. Um, I found it very helpful. Um, I'm sure everyone took the, the key messages. Uh, in terms of uh, shameless plugs, and actually, Michael, I didn't think yours was shameless at all for the BCC. Um, I just want to remind everybody that this is our year of trade. So please do follow the updates on our events pages and our social media. And a reminder that our annual conference, which will be on the 16th and 17th of June this year, I think it's going to be virtual, at least in part, um, is in planning. It's always the highlight of um, the business conference scene. Um, we've had William Hague, Prime Minister, uh, chances of many, many stripes come and talk. It's always interesting. Um, and tickets will be available from the 1st of March. Um, this is being recorded and will go on the YouTube channel um, pretty shortly. Uh, so I would urge you all to go and look at that, uh, as well as the videos of the cats dancing, whatever else we, it is we do to get through lockdown. Um, and in terms of your three main sources of information around rules of origin and elsewhere, well, I'm going to say four, actually, I would say there's there's four to look up. The first one and I have to say, of course, is through your, your chamber or whether that's in the UK or international. Um, whether you are a member or not we will do our best to help although obviously if you uh, do you want to take advantage of our services and you think there are wider things that we can do to help then we would love to have you as part of our membership the second one i would put uk tpo into google it's an incredibly valuable resource um, very accessible very easy and, and i think gives that that context really beautifully and third um, i would put anna javeska into google um, although I can't pronounce it, the tip is the Z goes trade, before the S. Trade and borders. If you put trade and borders, my website comes up. Please feel free to contact me about rules of origin. No, that's exactly right. And I was going to say the Z comes before the S, but don't uh, don't come at her on Twitter unless you know exactly what you're doing because you're going down. This is a woman who doesn't <laughs> muck around on social media. Um, I hope people have found this interesting. We're thinking about how we might be able to assist and, and look at some other topics as we, we move forward. So watch this space. But other than to say thank you to Michael, to Anna and to Paul for their expertise, insight and um, erudition, um, I'm going to say goodbye and we look forward to hearing from you many again in the future. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I, I guess that's us. Well, look, thank you.